I once was analyzing a piece of music in a music theory class when a student asked, do we really need to ruin this beautiful music by analyzing it? Now, it was a fair question since music really should stand on its own without any verbal elaboration. So why do we analyze music? For me, it's a personal issue. When I hear a piece of music that blows me away, I want to understand it as completely as I can. I might want to emulate it in my own composition, or maybe I just want to be able to interpret the music better. Analyzation can really help get to the composer's process and give us a better idea of how to perform a piece. And if you understand music theory really well, it can help you to memorize the piece. Students also ask, is this really what the composer was thinking when he or she wrote the music? Again, a fair question, but one that we can rarely answer because in most cases, we have no idea what was going on in the composer's mind when writing the music. All we can do is try to figure out what's going on in our own ears when we hear it. So in this video, I'll analyze the first page of a Chopin mazurka, Opus 6, number 1, in F-sharp minor. And the excerpt has a pretty straightforward harmonic plan. It starts in the key of F-sharp minor, modulates to the relative major of A, and then modulates back to F-sharp minor. Simple. But when you look at how Chopin gets from A major to F-sharp minor, it's amazing. And I hope you'll gain some insight into the remarkable chromatic harmony and progression so easily at Chopin's disposal. As always, before we begin analyzing, we should make a chart of the key. And this piece being an F-sharp minor, let's go ahead and write ourselves out a F-sharp harmonic minor scale because harmonies usually derive from the harmonic minor scale. Some of these chord qualities will build up to the seventh because we'll need them in the analysis. So here are the chords, the one minor, the two half diminished seven, the three, that's major, the four, that's minor, the five seven, the 6, that's major, and the 7 diminished 7. And let's also build a chart in the key of A, because we'll need that too. Again, we'll build some of those chords up to the 7th. So we've got the 1, the 2, 7, the 3, the 4, the 5, 7, the 6, and the 7, which is half diminished 7. All right, we're going to go ahead and start our analysis. We see three sharps, and the first note as F sharp. So that's good enough for us to say that's the key of F sharp minor, and the first chord. Even though it's just one pitch, that'll have to be enough to call it a one chord. Moves on to the five chord, but we can see that the pitch of the five chord, the E sharp, doesn't come in until the second beat. The F sharp has been suspended from the previous measure. Preparation, suspension, resolution. So we have a four, three, suspension, with the seventh of the chord arriving right here. Passing tone, non-harmonic tone. And another non-harmonic tone. This one we leap into on a weak beat and then resolve, continue. The best explanation for that is an incomplete neighbor tone. You could also think of it as the lowered ninth of the chord. And this moves back to the one chord. Now we can see that the leading tone of F sharp minor is negated here with the E natural. We have a modulation. The best way of thinking of this is a modulation to the key of the relative major, the F sharp minor chord being the VI chord, a pivot chord, and then moving on to the V chord. And like the V chord over here, we have a few notes that are a little bit out of place. In other words, they've been introduced early as preparations, suspended, and then resolved, the four going to three, and also the two going to one. That's a double suspension, with the seventh of the chord being introduced by the end of the measure. Like the first measure, in an almost motivic way, we have a passing tone again, and another 
in complete neighbor tongue. The piece continues in the key of A, but really only for one more measure, because things are getting a little wild and crazy starting here. So we'll say in the key of A still, and we'll call this a one chord. And the one chord has a four, three suspension. The D being prepared in the previous measure and then resolving downward. Let's go back now and re-listen to those first four measures. We'll listen really carefully for those suspensions and also that quick modulation to the relative major of A. Now, bear with me here because I'm not going to explain this too much. I'm just going to plow forward because then when I'm done, I'll come back and try to consider this a different way. But I'm going to try a Roman numeral analysis and take a look at how, how crazy and almost awkward this seems. These two chords look like the key of C sharp minor to me. So I'm going to use this chord and consider it as a pivot chord in C sharp minor and then analyze in C sharp minor. Two, half diminished, four, three, going to five, seven. Here's the seventh of the chord. But the one chord never arrives. Instead, we have a, looks like a dominant chord. So we're gonna say that's a secondary dominant chord. Five, four, three of four. But these two chords look like they're actually a step lower. We're moving into a different key. We're going into a key that's a step lower than the C-sharp. This is the key of B minor, so I'm going to reanalyze this as a 5-4-3 of 5. And then these chords fit pretty easily in the key of B minor. 2, half diminished 4-3, and 5-7. There's the 7. Again, we don't ever get to the 1 chord. This is one of the hallmarks of the style here is we're going to go into these transient key areas without ever getting to a one chord. It just keeps pushing forward. This looks like a secondary chord of some sort. I'm going to say it's a seven diminished six, five, a four. But continuing the pattern, it looks like things are moving downward in terms of key areas. C sharp, B, A. We don't really know if it's A major or A minor because it never goes to the one chord, but we're going to reanalyze this in A and call it a 7, a diminished, 7 diminished, 6, 5, a 5. And then the harmony, actually not on all that unusual, a 2, half diminished, 4, 3, going to 5. Not going to the 1, of course, instead, kind of a secondary chord. Uh, we'll call that a 7 diminished, 6, 5. A four. Now, in order to see what's going on next, we have to look at the next page. And the pattern looks like it's still going on. In other words, these two chords look to me a lot like they're in the key of G or G minor. So I'm going to just, again, I don't want to commit to G or G minor. I'm just going to say G because we never get to the one chord. And I'm going to reanalyze this as the seven diminished 6, 5, a 5, and then move on here, continue on the key of G, and call this a 2, half diminished 4, 3. Of course, as a half diminished chord, it really does seem like it could be G minor, but we'll see later on in the piece, he uses borrowed chords quite a bit. So we really can't be sure. This is a five chord, five, seven. And then of course it never gets to the G, it never gets to the one chord. Instead, a secondary chord, seven, half diminished, four, three of A, so we'll say of two. But look what happens next. If you compare that to the very beginning of the piece, you'll see that we just have a return to the very beginning phrase of the piece. So, in fact, the G is moving down again to a key area that's lower, the original key of F sharp minor. So we're going to go ahead and 
reanalyze this as simply a 2 half diminished 4 3 in the key of F sharp minor. And as we did at the beginning of the piece, we have the 5 chord with a 4 3 suspension, the 7th arriving here, the passing tone, the incomplete neighbor tone. Moving back to the 1 chord. Here we're seeing the modulation to A again. So we have a pivot chord, the 6 chord, going to 5 with the double suspension again, 4, 3, 2, 1, the 7th arriving here, and the passing tone here, and the incomplete neighbor there. And this time the key of A sticks around a little bit longer. The 1 chord with a 4, 3 suspension moves on to the 4 chord. But look at how the 4 chord actually has an F natural, which makes it a borrowed chord. In the key of A major, that should have been a major chord. This leaps up to a non chord tone, so that's an appoggiatura on a strong beat. And we have a passing tone here. And this is another chord in the key of A, but another borrowed chord. This is more in the key of A minor. B, D, F, A. That's a two half diminished, 6-5. So these are both borrowed chords. Moving back to the 1 chord. And we repeat that. This measure gets repeated because it sounds so good. It's a 4 chord. Moving on to the 2 half diminished, 6-5, with the appoggiatura and the, oh, and the passing tone here. Back to the 1 chord. Look what happens here. He brings the 4 chord back, but now it's not a borrowed chord anymore. This is kind of interesting. It's just a 4 chord. What's going on here? Why did he do that? This is a beautiful moment in the piece. If you were performing this, you'd want to make sure to treat the return of F sharp as something very special. Because what's happened here is right at the end of the piece, he's written an F natural instead of F sharp, even though the key of the piece ultimately is F sharp. So he's negated the tonic of the ultimate key. He's got to bring it back, and he does it right here. It's a very dramatic moment. You know, also recall that at the very beginning of this piece, we were a bit surprised that Chopin started the piece with just a lone F-sharp pitch. Now we can see that this served to set up the issue that we have just observed. So let's continue to the end here. This chord also could be thought of in the key of A. It looks like a 7, half diminished. 4, 3. But as you can see, the piece is cadencing in F sharp minor. So this is more like a little pivot area to F sharp minor. This D major chord, now with the F sharp, is actually the 6 chord in F sharp minor. And then a 5 chord. And we finally get to cadence back to the 1 chord with what looks like an accented passing tone and another passing tone. Some people actually see this chord and say, oh, well, that's a 4 chord. It's a 6-4 chord, and uh, resolving to a 1 chord. So you can hear that as well. If you use my original analysis, you'd have to also indicate that as an accented passing tone. Well, actually, accented neighbor tone in this case, and a passing tone here. Let's listen to these last five measures again. Listen really carefully for that beautiful set of borrowed chords in the key of A major, and then that magical moment when F sharp returns in the modulation back to F sharp minor. Let's go back to that modulating section from A major to F sharp minor and consider different ways to understand the passage. We already analyzed it as a sequential modulation, moving through a series of transient and descending key areas, C-sharp, and then B, and A, G, and then finally back to F-sharp. 
Notice also that the sequence involves root tones that simply follow the circle of fifths. The A moves the tritone to D sharp and then goes on through the circle of fifths to G sharp, C sharp, F sharp, B, E, A, D, a tritone away to G sharp, and then to C sharp, the five of F sharp minor, and then of course finally to F sharp. One final way to view this sequence is to strip it of all decorative tones and isolate the voice leading in the four separate lines. Do you see that each line is simply a chromatic scale employed to connect A major with F sharp minor? Let's listen to the piece again, and this time follow any one of the lines to follow its chromatic descent, modulating from A back to F sharp minor. This very simple way of viewing the passage may be the best way to understand Chopin's elegant process. Thank you.